Good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Bloom. I'm the curator of the Chinese Garden and director of the Center for East Asian Garden Studies at the Huntington. And it's my pleasure um, to welcome you all to this evening's lecture by Professor Morgan Patelka on tea and politics in Japan's age of unification. Um, this lecture is part of our East Asian Gardens lecture series, which again this year is held online. Uh, we have a couple, um, we have at least two more talks this spring in February and April, and we very much hope that you'll be able to join us for those. Um, but for the moment, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Robert Murray, who will introduce this evening's speaker. So Robert, take it away. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for joining us for the Sen Genjutsu Annual Lecture on Japanese Culture. The lecture is held uh, in honor of Honsai Dai Sosho Dr. Genjutsu Sen, the 15th generation grandmaster of the Resenke School of Tea. But Resenke, as you know, is one of the major schools of tea, tracing its origins to Sen Rikyu, who established Chado, the way of tea in the late 16th century in Japan. Dr. Genshitsu Sen, who will celebrate his 100th birthday this April, made his first visit to the United States and to Los Angeles in 1951 as a delegate to the signing of the Peace Treaty of San Francisco, which reestablished peaceful relationships between the United States and Japan. Since his first overseas trip, he has traveled tirelessly around the world promoting the principles of harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility, which serve as the foundations of Chado. The Urasenke tradition of tea is now practiced in more than 37 countries around the world. The Huntington is proud to have an Urasenke tea house, Seifu An, the arbor of pure breeze as part of our Japanese garden. The tea house was designed by Dr. Sen's brother, uh, and was dedicated to him in 1964, and it was rededicated by his son, now the 16th generation grandmaster of Urasenke, uh, at the time of the garden's centennial in 2012. This evening's lecture is funded by an endowment from Frank and Toshia Mosher. Mrs. Mosher was in Hiroshima when the first atomic bomb was dropped. And like Dr. Sen, she worked tirelessly to promote peace. Toshia, unfortunately, passed away last year, but we would like to dedicate this lecture in her memory. Dr. Patelka is the Bernard L. Herman Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is a professor in the Department of History. He is a specialist in late medieval and early modern Japan with a focus on material culture, environmental history, and urban history. Many of you may remember Dr. Patalka when he taught at Occidental College. He has published extensively on tea culture, including a groundbreaking study of Raku ceramics. Recent publications of his include Reading Medieval Ruins, Urban Life and Destruction in 16th Century Japan through Cambridge University Press in 2021, Letters from Japan's 16th and 17th Century, the Correspondence of Warlords, Tea Masters, Zen Priests, and Aristocrats, and Spectacular Accumulation, Material Culture, Tokugawa, Ieyasu, and Samurai sociability. Dr. Patelka, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Robert, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to speak with you this evening. Uh, the topic of my presentation is the relationship between tea and politics, uh, in particular in the age of unification. Uh, the period that extends from roughly 1568 to 1615. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by the age of unification and where this fits in the larger flow of Japanese history during the talk. Uh, but 
I want to say that uh, I love studying and researching, writing about and teaching uh, tea history. And um, I come from a family of potters. So one of my connections to the sphere of tea culture is through ceramics and the study of uh, tea utensils. Um, but over the years, I've come to believe through my research that tea is essential to understanding uh, the flow of Japanese history, the role of the arts in politics, and the influence of politics on daily life. Uh, tea is uh, something that is both a part of Japan's shared global history. It is fundamentally um, important in Japan because of Japan's relationship to China and Korea, uh, its um, trade connections historically with Southeast Asia, but tea culture or chanoyu is also very distinctively Japanese. And so it captures so many aspects of what's interesting about studying Japanese history and culture. And at the Huntington, we're so lucky to have gardens and structures that allow us to have the, the experience in our bodies of being in a garden, being in a tea room, uh, feeling the sensory and aesthetic experience that tea practitioners in the past in Japan um, surrounded themselves with uh, for both, you know, personal, cultural, aesthetic, and indeed political reasons. Uh, so with no further ado, let me jump in. Um, there we go. So I have to give a little preamble before I talk about the age of unification, because the tradition of politicians, particularly the powerful samurai leaders of government known as shoguns, uh, collecting artworks and then using them, displaying them in social gatherings really reached its um, kind of important form in the 15th century during what's called the Ashikaga period. Uh, during this moment in Japanese history, the imperial court was located in Kyoto, as it had been since the 8th century, and the warrior government, which sometimes had been located separately from the imperial court, was also located in the imperial capital of Kyoto. And there was significant interaction and influence between the imperial court which in medieval Japan played a role, something like the, the, the Vatican in medieval Europe. And the warrior government known as the Ashikaga Shogunate was the political, legal, and kind of temporal authority of the realm. And at that time in the 15th century, the shoguns, the, the um, chief military rulers of Japan amassed a huge collection that consisted primarily of Chinese art imported to Japan on the regular ships that went back and forth between the Ming Dynasty in China and the various port cities of Japan. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, this collection today, historians call the Ashikaga Collection, and it was a really magnificent assemblage of uh, ceramics, paintings, uh, metal objects, and other treasures, many of which were antiques from earlier dynasties in China, that the Ashikaga shoguns not only collected and stored, but also displayed in the palaces in Kyoto at the social gatherings that they used to exhibit their power, negotiate their relationships with other warrior leaders, uh, and to experience pleasurable social gatherings. They would surround themselves with works of art like this uh, remarkable Chinese manufactured ceramic jar. Uh, and they would hold poetry salons, they would hold um, banquets, they would engage in various ceremonial activities uh, with a whole range of uh, Chinese artworks uh, carefully arranged on shelves or on stands uh, as a kind of backdrop that uh, signified their deep 
civilizational connection to traditional China. Um, the jar that you see on the screen was made uh, probably between the 13th and 14th centuries uh, in what is called the Southern Song Dynasty or at the very beginning of the Yuan Dynasty. Um, it is a type of jar that was probably exported out of Guangzhou. Um, it's about 40 centimeters tall. And it is a, a type of jar that was manufactured in fairly large quantities using uh, the coil construction technique where the potter uh, rolls out long coils of clay and slowly builds them up to form the shape of the jar and then uses uh, a, a paddle, a wooden paddle, sometimes wrapped with rope or uh, some kind of material to flatten and shape the jar into the precise shape that we see uh, on, on the screen. That process also flattens and thins the walls, and you end up with a surprisingly lightweight uh, utensil. Uh, this particular jar had uh, a white slip applied to the upper sort of two-thirds of the jar, and a layer on top of that of translucent glaze, probably made of ash, uh, that produces this wonderful layered effect where you have the glossy glaze, the white slip underneath, and then the drip marks down over the iron rich uh, reddish brownish clay where we can still see the lines from the original coil construction. Um, these types of jars were produced to store uh, various, various goods, various products, uh, throughout East Asia, and they often would be loaded onto ships, heavily laden, and could even serve as a kind of ballast. But in Japan, uh, and this is very much part of the tradition that I'm uh, referencing here, these and other uh, artworks imported from China were repurposed and used in new ways. Uh, in particular, eventually these types of jars were highly uh, prized for their ability to store tea leaves. Um, and, and you could age your tea leaves to just the right um, moment when they should be ground into matcha, the powdered green tea that Japanese tea practitioners preferred. So I'm showing you this jar to represent a whole period, uh, the Ashikaga period, uh, when the shoguns were amassing this marvelous Ashikaga collection. Um, and unfortunately, Japan in 1467 entered into a 10-year war that racked the capital city of Kyoto and undermined the authority of the Ashikaga shogunate, this warrior government. And as a result, this collection over not just the period of this decade, but even afterwards, gradually dispersed. Um, it seems that the members of the Ashikaga Shogunate family used these precious objects, these precious Chinese artworks, uh, in their social and political negotiations. They gave them as gifts to warlords who they uh, needed to lean on for protection. They would offer them in return for a favor. They would send them to curry favor with someone who they were trying to bring over to their side. They were really desperately trying to shore up their central uh, authority, largely, it has to be said, unsuccessfully. And as a result, many of the objects in the Ashikaga collection were spread out across Japan and entered the collections of independent warrior leaders uh, who at the time uh, were called daimyo, but which usually we call today warlords. Um, these warlords still acknowledged the former greatness of the Ashikaga shoguns, but they were largely independent. And many of them had come to power not through receiving a title from the shogun, but simply through acts of war, through uh, military might. Um, despite their, their kind of rough uh, you know, social rise, uh, many of them were tea practitioners and became, through the spread of the Ashikaga collection, collectors. So um, this dissemination of the collection of Chinese art that had been based in the shogunate in Kyoto to 
warrior leaders and their um, merchant and Buddhist advisors all across Japan is a really important moment in the history of tea because it spreads what had been an elite urban culture across the archipelago. And that lays the foundations or plant the seeds, plants the seeds for a kind of national flowering of interest in tea culture using Chinese ceramics, Chinese utensils as the um, objects you need to, to make tea and serve tea on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me give you a quick example of this. The warlord Asakura Yoshikage, who ruled the province of Echizen. Uh, today, this is the part of Japan known as Fukui Prefecture. Um, he was the last ruler in his family. Uh, he was destroyed by the first of the three unifiers, who I'll talk about in a few moments. But before his untimely end, he was a very active patron of culture and indeed a collector of tea utensils and Chinese art, including works from the Ashikaga collection. Uh, we know this because of various documents that survived and record uh, where some of the most famous Chinese artworks from Kyoto ended up. Uh, and he's listed in uh, one of those documents as the owner of several of the important works from the Ashikaga collection. But we also have an extant tea caddy, which is a very small ceramic container for medicine uh, in a Chinese context or in the Japanese context for powdered green tea, for matcha. Uh, that is part of the tea gathering. It plays a really important role in certain tea gatherings as the um, container that comes out and is displayed to the guests. The ivory lid is removed and tea is scooped out as part of the ritual performance. This particular tea caddy, which is usually known by the name Honnoji, which is the name of a temple, has a second name. Uh, tea utensils in Japan often are given these individualized names because they were so beloved by tea practitioners that they came to have a kind of biography as objects. The second name of this tea caddy was Asakura eggplant. Um, and this is a reference to the fact that it has this bulbous shape that looks a bit like the base of a nice ripe purple eggplant. Uh, and it's a, a style of uh, tea utensil that was beloved in the 16th century and that was made like the, the tea jar and like many of the paintings uh, imported from China uh, on the mainland in the Song Dynasty. Uh, so just a small example of the way that these um, precious objects from the Ashikaga collection spread out across Japan and were used at the local level by warrior leaders like Asakura Yoshikage. So after the 10-year war that I mentioned that really undermined the authority of the Ashikaga shogunate, there was a long period of many decades when there was essentially no central authority in Japan. And this age is often called the Sengoku or uh, warring states period. Uh, it was not necessarily uh, a period of constant civil war, although at any given moment there was conflict someplace in the Japanese archipelago. Rather, it was a period when nobody was calling the shots and the emperor was a figurehead, powerless and often chased out of the palace in Kyoto. The Ashikaga shoguns, in theory, still existed, but they couldn't really command anyone to do anything. And it wasn't until the rise of three successive warlords, or daimyo, who did manage to gradually unify the territories of Japan, bring more and more warlords under their banners, and one by one, building on each other's accomplishments, they reunified Japan and brought peace and stability to the nation after really a century of civil war. The first of these men is Oda Nobunaga, whose portrait you see on the screen. Uh, and Nobunaga was uh, from a distinguished warrior family, uh, but he was an eclectic individual. He was prone to making decisions and making pronouncements 
that did not follow precedent and did not adhere to tradition. And one of his innovations was that after um, entering the national stage, uh, becoming the most powerful warrior who could control the Kyoto region, he realized that a lot of his peers, a lot of warlords cared deeply about tea. And they collected tea utensils, particularly the so-called famous objects of the Ashikaga collection. And he decided he too needed to acquire a collection of tea utensils. But being rather eclectic, he announced a campaign, like a military campaign, to acquire a collection for himself. And he sent out several of his warrior vassals to engage in what was called the Meibutsugari, which literally translates as the hunt for famous objects. So this was like a hunting expedition, except the prey uh, was not deer or boar uh, or uh, you know fowl. Rather, it was Chinese works of art, famous Chinese works of art, ideally objects from the Ashikaga collection. Um, he sent his vassals to the residences of wealthy collectors in Kyoto. Uh, and I don't think those collectors really had the option to say no. Uh, they were remunerated for their um, for the, the utensils that were collected. But uh, I think if they'd said no, they would have had to give up their heads instead. Um, then he sent his men to a city to the south of Kyoto called Sakai. Uh, today, Sakai is essentially a suburb of Osaka, one of the biggest cities in Japan. But in the 16th century, Sakai was an incredibly important center of commerce and culture. Sakai was the port that much of the licensed trade with Ming Dynasty China flowed through. And as a result, the merchants of Sakai had grown so wealthy and influential that in certain periods during this long age of warring states, they were able to broker a kind of semi-independent status for the city of Sakai. So they were commercially successful, culturally uh, extremely accomplished, and politically quite savvy. Nobunaga was, was not always a brute, although he was capable of extreme acts of violence. And so he did work with uh, contacts that he had in Sakai, uh, he worked with uh, a merchant uh, tea master and members of the Buddhist community uh, who were all well connected in the city. And he indeed acquired a marvelous collection of tea utensils through this Meibutsugari, this hunt for famous objects. And he didn't completely alienate the merchants of Sakai in the process, which is in and of itself a really remarkable accomplishment. Uh, Nobunaga. Also, once he acquired this collection of tea utensils, he started to hire uh, several men who had made names for themselves in this growing culture of urban tea practice as what were called tea masters. Now, tea masters today are usually um, you know, related to schools of tea like Urasenke, right? They're part of a big institution that is educational and cultural in nature and that aims to spread the study of tea, the, the, the knowledge about art that you can gain through tea practice and the, the pleasure, um, the sense of peacefulness that can be gained through taking part in the tea ceremony. None of that existed yet in the 16th century. Instead, you have individual men and sometimes women who become interested in the way that tea culture gives you, first of all, um, access to a culture of bodily uh, mastery. You have to still your body and sit in the correct posture, almost like you're engaged in a kind of meditation. You have to learn the choreographed movements of preparing and serving tea. Um, many tea practitioners were also uh, affiliated with Zen or other Buddhist schools. So there was a deep spiritual connection. And you also acquired a deep knowledge of art and connoisseurship through the practice of tea. So there were many different things that attracted people to the world of tea. 
But as warrior leaders prioritized the tea ceremony as one of the social arenas in which they could engage in politics, tea also became a way of networking, uh, meeting important and powerful people, and gaining access to the inner circles of leaders like Oda Nobunaga, the first unifier, the man who sent out his vassals to conduct this Meibutsugari. So Nobunaga started to organize tea gatherings using his tea utensils. And it's interesting to think about analogs to this in the world we live in. Um, it's hard to find a, a really helpful comparator, although the, the, the practice that I often fall back on is golf, because golf involves the body, it involves skill and mastery, it also is fun, and it also is an opportunity to talk with uh, your peers um, away from the office, and maybe even to strike up friendships, create alliances, and make deals that will benefit you both professionally and personally. Also, like golf, it's a place where many people can participate, but often the wealthiest are the ones who will thrive. So Nobunaga putting on his own tea gathering is a little bit like, I'm not going to name any names, but a rich and powerful politician who owns his own golf course holding a golf championship. Um, but much more sophisticated and, and much more aesthetically pleasing. At least to me, I'm not a golfer. So forgive me, those of you in the, in the audience who, who love a good game. Um, this on the screen, which might be hard to see depending on the size of the screen that you're, you're watching this with, is an entry from a tea diary, a very important primary source from the 16th century called Tennojia Kaiki, um, which is the record of the Tennojia family, um, uh, or, or rather the Tennojia business that is run by the Tsuda family. And it records a gathering hosted by Nobunaga at Shokokuji Temple in Kyoto uh, in 1574. Uh, in this diary, the author records that a very famous Chinese painting was displayed in the Tokonoma or decorative alcove, um, a very important Chinese ceramic tea caddy was um, used, uh, a, a Korean uh, tea bowl, an imported Korean tea bowl was used, and alongside the tea caddy, these were placed on a long, probably lacquered tray. Um, a brazier was displayed on a lacquered board. A shallow iron kettle was on a tripod. Um, a particular kind of bamboo tea scoop was used. And then the host, the man who was charged by Nobunaga with performing the ritual of preparing the tea and serving the tea is named. And that is a tea practitioner named Baisetsu. What's really interesting is that the author records his absolute sense of wonder at encountering not Nobunaga, but the ceramic tea caddy named uh, Hatsuhana, which I have translated as first flower. I will show you a picture of Hatsuhana in a minute. It, is, it still survives. It's in the collection of the Tokugawa Art Museum, and it has one of the most amazing biographies of any ceramic in all of Japanese history, traveling through the collections of these rich and powerful warlords and other tea collectors before finally entering into one of the finest uh, private museums in Japan. Um, he talks about it the way you might talk about seeing a movie star or encountering uh, a um, beautiful painting in the Louvre. Uh, it had three dripping striations in the glaze, and the lips of the mouth are slightly flat. The glaze was applied to look like light persimmon under dark persimmon. The clay had a purplish color, and the base was like the bottom of a ghost stone bowl. The color of the glaze seemed to contain something of the purple color of the clay, making it look still more graceful. The back of the jar was truly beautiful in appearance, and so on and so forth. So this tea master who was a participant in the gathering was there with another tea master, Sen no Rikyu, probably the most important 
tea practitioner and tea master in all of Japanese history, and ultimately the, the founder, in a sense, of the Urasenke Tea School, the ancestor of the man for whom this lecture series is named. Uh, and so this gathering is a moment when the warrior patronage of tea that had been so important from the 15th into the 16th centuries and had preserved these remarkable Chinese artworks that really were threatened by civil war was started was 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 um, becoming an arena in which urban commoners, men like Sen no Rikyu or like Tsuda Sogyu, who were not samurai, they were not warlords or shoguns, could influence the development of tea. Uh, so tea became a somewhat open, uh, I wouldn't say democratic because the wealthy warrior still could confiscate your collection if he wanted to, but a place where meaning and the notion of what was or wasn't beautiful, what wasn't or wasn't useful in the tea gathering was contested. And that's where tea culture really started to develop and innovate in new ways in exactly this period from the 1570s onward. So I wanna now show you a few objects that are extant today that are either listed here in this entry from a tea diary or are very similar to the objects listed here. First is this incredible uh, important cultural property. So this is a, an art object that is named by the Japanese government as being um, a, a kind of nationally recognized piece of heritage. Uh, titled Painting of a Returning Sailboat. This was painted by uh, a Chinese uh, monk, uh, Yu Jian, during the Southern Song Dynasty. And it has the beautiful calligraphy and brushwork that you see of painters in the Zen ink painting tradition uh, that is so subtle, but also so powerful. Uh, could have been used for meditation uh, in a Zen monastery, uh, could have been used as a kind of active med meditation in its production, but that also came to be highly valued by tea practitioners as the opening artwork that would be placed in the decorative alcove or the tokonoma at the beginning of the tea gathering. Here we see the very same Chinese ceramic tea caddy named in that entry, the um, object known as Hatsuhana or first flower. You can see exactly what Sogyu, the author described, the two layers of glaze light persimmon under dark persimmon. And again, we see the fascination that tea practitioners had with glaze that drips down in unique patterns. The men who admired these uh, Chinese ceramics and these distinctive asymmetrical drips, I'm convinced could have recreated them from memory if given pen and paper. Uh, they obsessed over these lines and these patterns uh, as though they were beautiful human bodies. Uh, here we have a Korean tea bowl made during the Choson dynasty in the Bunjong ware style. In Japan, these types of uh, tea bowls were often called Ido. This particular object is not the same one that was named in that entry, but I think it's similar. This one was given the name Roso and was later owned by the second unifier, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, as well as the warrior tea master, Furuta Oribe. Um, here is a shallow metal kettle of the type used uh, in Nobunaga's gathering. The kettle, of course, is what the boiling water is located in. So you would take the lid off and scoop the water out uh, to uh, purify the tea bowl and then to make tea. And lastly, we have uh, a tea scoop in the style um, of the tea scoop that is mentioned uh, in the tea diary. Tea scoops are not um, sort of obviously artworks at the level of the painting, the ceramics, and the metalwork, um, but they were very much valued by tea practitioners and often given as gifts. One of the things that's distinctive about a tea scoop is that a tea practitioner could carve and make his own tea scoops, and then give them to friends, to students, to disciples uh, as gifts that would become very meaningful. So often there's a separate bamboo container, as you can see here on the right, that records in calligraphy uh, who made the tea scoop and if it has a name, what the name is. So these are all illustrations of how for Nobunaga and for 
the both warrior and commoner tea practitioners of this period, a tea gathering was an opportunity to display your cultural capital, to show off your collection, however you acquired it, but also to make tea possibly, to serve tea, or to hire a tea master who would do that on your behalf. Um, you, can, uh, you can cement relationships in the selection and arrangement of utensils. You might choose objects that you know will appeal to one of the participants in the gathering. You can essentially flatter them non-verbally by appealing to their aesthetic sensibilities. Um, you also can engage in deals. You can use a bowl that you actually hope to give away or to sell. Uh, so the tea gathering is at one level a kind of ritual space where you leave the, the political concerns of the world behind you. Ideally, that's what the tea gathering is meant to accomplish. But it also was a place where a wheeler dealer could get a lot of important work done. So let me move on to the second of the three unifiers, these, these powerful warlords who built on each other's accomplishments at the very end of the 16th century to gradually reunify Japan after a period of civil war. Toyotomi Hideyoshi was one of Oda Nobunaga's vassals. And when Nobunaga came to an untimely end, Hideyoshi very savvily and strategically rushed in to fill the gap. He um, engaged in a military campaign to punish the man who had betrayed Nobunaga. And he really just through force of will as well as military strategy, elevated himself to the position of being the inheritor of Nobunaga's legacy. Hideyoshi was, in some ways, even more eccentric than Nobunaga. He was not from a distinguished lineage. He seems to have come from a family of peasant warriors, farmers who would sometimes take up the sword, which was not uncommon in medieval Japan. Uh, and he was a brilliant strategist, uh, a talented samurai, and a charismatic leader. Um, he also was deeply insecure about his own lowly origins. And so he aspired to succeed at everything. He wanted to have the highest court rank of any warrior who had ever lived. So he threw money at the imperial court, you know, sort of lavish ceremonies, um, it repaired the palaces, and, and sure enough, rose through the ranks and often was known by his court title. Uh, he was a huge fan of the theater, and he would not only build um, uh, stages and commission new plays, but he would actually act in plays himself, sometimes playing the role of himself. So he was a little bit of a narcissist. And in the world of tea, he had a predilection for the gaudy and the gold and the bright and the beautiful. The problem for Hideyoshi is that the current of tea culture at the time was moving in the opposite direction. So the tea master who we've mentioned already, Sen Norikyu, who was a merchant from Sakai, a practitioner of Zen Buddhism, and by all accounts, the most innovative and insightful tea master uh, of of a, a large group of innovative tea masters active at the time, Hideyoshi had to have Dikyu as his man. He hired Dikyu to be a tea master, to curate Hideyoshi's own rapidly growing collection, uh, but also to host tea gatherings that he, Hideyoshi, would organize for his own political, social, cultural purposes. And there was clearly friction between these two men. Rikyu became known as the champion of what is usually referred to in English as wabi tea. Wabi is a Japanese poetic word that is very difficult to translate. Um, the easiest translation is to just say rustic, but it also can mean um, an appreciation of old things, of asymmetrical things, of even of broken things. It's, um, it's an aesthetic sensibility that is um, interested in natural, uh, aged beauty, rather than exclusively the kind of bright perfection that we saw in many of the Chinese objects that were imported in 
uh, the 15th century. Uh, an example of this is the Raku ceramic tradition that, as Philip mentioned, I have researched and written about. As Robert mentioned, excuse me, I've researched and written about. And on the screen, uh, you see a, a really classic Raku Tibul uh, attributed to the first generation head of the Raku lineage, whose name was Chojiro. And as you can see, this is not uh, a symmetrical, brightly glazed object. It is a muted, uh, almost um, volcanic kind of tea bowl that looks like it's made out of the stones that you could find in the Kamo River. And in fact, it is. The glaze that was used on Raku ceramics was partially produced by grinding Kamo River stones into a powder and mixing them with lead and other ingredients. So Rikyu was a champion of very subtle, natural and muted objects. He would also incorporate Chinese treasures. He was flexible and could create, I think, a, a meaningful tea gathering with almost any assemblage of tea utensils. But his preference was for Korean tea bowls that had a simple white or gray glaze or a greenish glaze for black raku and maybe black seto tea bowls as well. Um, and uh, this really created a conflict in a sense with his employer. Hideyoshi commissioned a remarkable portable tea room that was uh, decorated almost entirely with gold. That structure is no longer extant, but here we see a reproduction uh, based on descriptions of the tea room um, that is remarkable. It's beautiful. And indeed, gold is one of the beloved colors used in a lot of late 16th century architecture and uh, palaces and castles as an accent in paintings, um, as a, a, a major color in lacquer work. Uh, but to have an entire room that was gold and red was a rather profound statement of gaudy, almost Baroque aesthetics. Uh, and um, we don't have firm evidence of how deep the conflict between Hideyoshi and Semnodiki went, but it must have been uh, a difficult relationship to navigate. Still, Hideyoshi was undeterred in his uh, absolute determination to uh, use tea as a vehicle for the expression of his own power. So in 1587, famously, uh, Hideyoshi organized uh, a monumental tea gathering that was to last a week, located at Kitano Shrine in Kyoto. And he sent out a message across all of Japan that literally commanded all followers of tea culture to attend or to risk being barred from tea practice forever. They should bring their tea utensils, set up a kind of ad hoc tea space someplace in the gardens of Kitano Shrine. Hideyoshi himself said he would also set up shop and display his utensils, and they would practice tea for days. Rikyu was, in some sense, the master of ceremonies. And for a day, at least, Hideyoshi did what he had promised. He was there preparing tea, showing off his collection. Rikyu was preparing tea. Uh, and many tea practitioners from across Japan came and participated in this incredible gathering. But it seems, scholars believe, that Hideyoshi was surprised at how quirky and innovative many of the less wealthy, less powerful tea practitioners' displays were. He was sort of one-upped by creativity. He thought, I have the most and best utensils and bigger is always better, so I will look like the most powerful man in the land at this Kitano grand tea gathering. But instead, all of his bluster was perhaps overshadowed by creative Wabi tea men who wove together branches to create you know, innovative and artistic structures and other uh, innovative displays. So the whole gathering was essentially canceled after one day, but it's a wonderful expression of this tension in the world of tea, where you have these powerful warrior patrons on the one hand, and these innovative, relatively unknown tea practitioners on the other. And then you have men like Sen no Rikyu, who are kind of caught in the middle, trying to negotiate some sort of settlement. In the end, Sen no Rikyu was unfortunately forced to take his own life by Hideyoshi. 
for reasons that to this day are not exactly understood. There are many potential conflicts beyond the aesthetic one that could have caused that. But Bikyu's life came to an end in 1591. Hideyoshi himself died in 1598. After Hideyoshi, the third of the three unifiers was the wily old warlord, ruler of the largest parcel of land in all of Japan in the eastern part of the country, Tokugawa Ieyasu. And Tokugawa Ieyasu of the three unifiers was very clearly, unquestionably, the least interested in tea culture. He almost never appears in the tea diary records of the gatherings that Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and the tea masters like Sen no Rikyu, uh, were so active in. He did not, however, ignore tea entirely. First of all, he acquired tea utensils and other uh, treasures of imported works, as well as new objects being made in Japanese workshops, Japanese kilns, and in the kilns of uh, Korean potters who had been forcibly removed from Korea and brought to Japan in the 1590s during the Japanese invasion of Korea. So Ieyasu did build a collection. And the way that I think about it is that he was essentially creating a kind of investment portfolio for his family. Nobunaga had failed to invest in the future of his family. Hideyoshi had tried, but not really been successful. He had only a young uh, child heir at the time of his death. Ieyasu was not going to make the same mistake as his peers, and not only had many, many children, but he wanted them to be with, uh, excuse me, rich and secure. Rich not only in terms of uh, specie, money, gold, gold and silver coins, but rich also in treasures, including tea utensils. But beyond that, he also hired a tea master uh, named Furuta Oribe, who had been a student, really a disciple of Sen no Rikyu. Oribe was the perfect tea master for the Tokugawa because he was, on the one hand, himself a samurai. He was uh, the, a member of the important Furuta family of warriors. He was himself a daimyo. Um, but on the other hand, he had this um, deep relationship with Rikyu, who Rikyu at certain moments in his career indicated perhaps that Oribe was one of the few men who really understood his teachings. Um, and Oribe organized tea gatherings on behalf of the Tokugawa after they established a new military government in Edo known as the Tokugawa shogunate. And Oribe served Ieyasu and then his successor, um, Ieyasu's son Hidetada. So he was essentially tea master to the Tokugawa shogunate, the new government that ruled Japan beginning in 1603. And Oribe innovated in ways that are perhaps a little surprising. Um, usually when we hear the name Oribe in tea circles, we think of a style of ceramics made in Mino province that are named after Furuta Oribe. Oribe um, uh, dishes and tea bowls, which are these wonderful, asymmetrical, abstractly decorated works of art. Um, the connection with the tea master Furuta Oribe is unclear. Instead, what we do have clear records of are the new ceremonies that Oribe helped to create that were a better fit for the needs of the Tokugawa as the lords of the land, as the rulers of not just a particular domain, but a reunified Japan. And in particular, what Oribe helped the Tokugawa to do was to link the tea gathering with a kind of ceremony that's very important in Japanese history called the onari. And the onari literally means your honorable visit or you, you, you honorably come. And it refers to what's called a visitation ceremony when one powerful warrior leader would visit the palace or castle or residence of another warrior leader for a tete-a-tete, -tete, for uh, some kind of an argument, for a new alliance, uh, to arrange uh, a marriage between their children, or for some other important meeting. Um, visitation ceremonies usually involved gift exchange. 
So in some 16th century Onari, you have warrior leaders giving swords and horses and Chinese ceramics, um, really expensive, valuable treasures uh, to, to signal their commitment to building a relationship, uh, to honoring the, their partner in the ceremony. Now, this is important because this is a society of warriors, and this is a period of significant precarity. Uh, these men um, were frequently assassinated. They frequently were betrayed by their own generals. So these ceremonies were a moment to try to knit together a sense of community and a sense of trust. So Furuta Oribe, the warrior tea master who, who served Tokugawa Ieyasu, helped the Tokugawa to combine tea ceremonies that were all the rage with onari. And they would have a two or even three stage ceremony. So this is really a day long event in which a tea gathering would be held and then they would move into a separate chamber to have gift exchange and warrior rituals. Often there would be suits of armor on display, swords on a sword rack, things that you would never see in a tea gathering. And then sometimes you move back into the tea room to have another round of tea and perhaps a meal. So this was uh, an evolution of tea culture that was particular to the needs of the shogunate, the warrior government. I'll end with a description um, of a really remarkable event, the siege of Osaka Castle that happened. Uh, really, there were two sieges, but I'm referring to as one extended conflict. It happened in 1614 and 1615. Um, this is when the heir to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the second of the three unifiers, had become essentially a young man and was old enough that if he had the support, he could have challenged the Tokugawa. He lived in Osaka Castle, which was perhaps the most impressive fortress in all of Japan. And the Tokugawa felt that for their government and their um, reign to last, they had to remove Toyotomi Hideyori, and they did. They created a pretext, they attacked the castle, they couldn't destroy it at the first effort, so they signed a peace treaty, filled in the moat, tore down the walls, and then came back months later to finish the job. And they, they succeeded. They wiped the Toyotomi off the face of the earth, destroyed the castle. What's interesting is that the Toyotomi had a remarkable collection of treasures, including tea utensils. And there is documentary evidence that Tokugawa Ieyasu, who was just a few years away from his own death, sent his vassals into the rubble of the castle to search for these treasures his own mebutsugari, if you will, his own hunt for famous objects, so that he could rehabilitate them perhaps, but more importantly, possess them, own the collection of the Toyotomi. And this seems very fanciful. Uh, there is a tea caddy uh, in the Seikado Art Museum uh, named Jo Nasu. Uh, this is another eggplant-shaped caddy that it was always claimed was one of these objects. But when you look at it, you don't see any um, gold lacquer repairs of the kind that have some become so popular of late. And it seems like a fanciful tale. Why in the end would a, a, you know, a powerful man like Tokugawa Ieyasu, the Tokugawa government itself, really need to care about finding and rehabilitating the treasures of the Toyotomi? They ruled Japan. They had just defeated their only remaining enemies. But the museum that owns this object decided to subject it to scientific testing to discover if this story was true. And they x-rayed the tea caddy. And on the screen is the result. The story is true. This object was probably contained in a, a fabric pouch inside of a wooden box. And even if that box was crushed by a falling wall, even if the box uh, broke, and perhaps even eventually burned in the flames of the destruction of the castle, the pieces of the tea caddy were preserved, they were collected by Ieyasu's vassals, and they were put back together using lacquer, not to highlight the cracks the way is often done today, but to perfectly reform the original 
and for this beautiful object to enter into the collection of the Tokugawa. So um, I think this effort, right, the fact that the Tokugawa went to this labor to possess the pieces of the Toyotomi collection that they could, and that this form of collecting and display of tea utensils became a fundamental part of the warrior politics of the Tokugawa period all the way up to the 19th century, shows that tea was indeed about pleasurable gatherings, connections to Zen Buddhism, deep spiritual meaning, but also in every aspect fundamentally was a political act and part of the, the narrative of the political development of Japan uh, throughout its pre-modern and into the modern day in terms of its modern history. So um, that's my, my quick summary for today. I look forward to your questions and to the conversation we're going to have now. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Patelka, um, for your illuminating talk. Um, it was amazing to end with the Joe Nasu and to see how that object had been reconstructed from almost, I mean, just literally from shards. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, we have a couple of questions already, but I just would like to remind everyone first that if you do have questions for Dr. Patelka, please enter them into the Q&A box that appears probably at the bottom of your screen, depending on the device you're using, and I will pose them. Um, so uh, let's start um, with Senorikyu and um, Hideyoshi. Did, was it Senorikyu who created the golden tea room for Hideyoshi, or who designed that structure? Sorry, I was muted. That's a great question. Um, I don't think we know. So we see reference to the Golden Tea Room in contemporaneous documents, and, and actually more significantly in, in later documents, it kind of became part of the, um, the mytho history in a way of tea in this period of Hideyoshi's reign. And I use that term not to say that it's that they're untrue, but that everything became a little bit larger than life. You know, it became part of this narrative of an age when everyone was sort of a titan of industry, except in, in you know, late 16th century period terms. So as far as I know, I'm not an architectural historian, but as far as I know, we don't know who designed the tea hut. There were, there were many tea rooms being built uh, in the late 16th century as part of the colossal rebuilding of Kyoto, the creation of palaces, new Buddhist temples, castles, uh, by Hideyoshi, as well as all the warlords of Japan. Um, Hideyoshi, um, at one point, he decided to build a new castle in the Fushimi district, uh, sort of south of Kyoto. And he ordered all of the warlords, who were now his vassals, to construct residences in Fushimi around his new castle. And most of them would have built tea rooms or separate uh, tea houses as part of their construction. So this was a period of real architectural vibrancy, so it's a little difficult to know for certain who designed that. Um, another fairly specific question. If Uribe was a student of Rikyu, how did Rikyu teach him? Um, was it like a correspondence course about tea, or <laughs> how, how did that happen? So Oribe and Rikyu, um, we have documentation of them being together on many occasions. Uh, they appear together in many tea gatherings, and in list in in documentary evidence from the time, we have uh, lots of of texts that mention that Nikyu had you know a, a, a small group of disciples, and that Oribe was one of the key members. So I think we can imagine that they would have invited each other to many tea gatherings that they would have engaged in other social activities together, um, whether that's um, you know, Buddhist practice or in the case of Oribe, um, traveling as a warrior, engaging in warrior activities such as falconry. Um, uh, Oribe would have often traveled with uh, Hideyoshi. And so Riku, who served almost as a kind of diplomat for Hideyoshi, would have been in his company as well. So they were part of the same social circle in a sense, even though Oribe was a samurai and Riku was an urban commoner. Thank you. Um, so 
No, I, I don't know if to, whether I should pose this together or not, but I'll try it. So um, first, did tea take the place of war for warlords? And a wonderful question. In, in a somewhat, I think potentially a somewhat related vein, um, is there a connection between monetization, um, it's, that is the use of currency, and this political legitimacy? legitimation of tea that you've been discussing. Um, in other words, I, I think how did how does economics play into Great the, the yeah. history that you were describing? So let me take those questions in order. So did tea take the place of war for the warlords? Um, originally, I don't think that it did. So in the time of uh, the the Sengoku period, the age of warring states, uh, when warlords across Japan were acquiring their own collections of Chinese famous objects and often holding tea ceremonies. Um, I think that tea was part of a package of social rituals that warriors engaged in. I've written about this in my book called Spectacular Accumulation um, that functioned, I think, to knit together warrior society after it was torn asunder through the literal act of war. Um, this is a period where warfare happens on a fairly regular basis. Uh, warlords and their vassals go into the field. They fight. Some of those men die. Some men don't obey orders. Others perform admirably. Everything is mixed up. And that tea, um, practices like falconry, uh, holding a banquet, holding a gift exchange was a way to reform bonds, reestablish hierarchy. So I think that was the initial attraction of the tea ceremony for warriors. By the late 16th century, tea has become an arena in which men could compete, uh, warlords could compete. It didn't take the place of tea, um, but you could become famous as a tea master like Oribe without being a particularly talented general. Right, So it could be a substitute, the same as in the world we live in. You might be bad at your job, but really good at running a marathon. And that gives you a kind of you know, social cachet. Uh, tea could play a similar role. In the Tokugawa period, however, which is from 1603 to 1868, more than 250 years, mostly of peaceful stability with the Tokugawa family at you know, ruling Japan. There were basically no wars to fight. And I think members of the samurai class did indeed engage in a whole range of cultural practices competitively. Um, they weren't waging war through tea, but they were competing with one another in often friendly ways, but sometimes with real stakes. Uh, so um, tea existed alongside war and sometimes their histories are interwoven, I think is one way to put it. Thank you for that question. The next question, about the monetization of tea or the kind of commodification of tea utensils and tea culture. Um, in th There's been some really interesting research on this topic. Um, one argument that uh, uh, a tea practitioner and scholar named Dale Slusser um, wrote was that tea flowered in the period of Sen no Dikyu precisely because the warlords monopolized the Chinese tea treasures. And so urban commoners, you know, Buddhist monks, merchants, uh, artisans who wanted to engage in tea culture had to create a new aesthetics that had room culturally and aesthetically for innovation because they couldn't get at the old masters, right? Those were all in the collections of these warlords. And it's a really, um, innovative idea that, that implies that this was a culture that evolved and innovated, not through the decisions of individuals, but through the kind of collective socioeconomic needs and the way those were reflected in culture of the broader community of diverse tea practitioners. I think it's a very convincing um, argument, although it's one of the things that we can always argue about because there's no sort of hard and fast way to prove it quantitatively. I think this question is also getting at the actual use of currency. Um, did these, like, did tea objects um, 
Well, how were they traded? Uh, how did they circulate? Was it yeah. um, through an exchange of currency? Was it through an exchange simply of objects? Was it just, were they yeah. presented as um, forced gifts or how did that, how did all of that work? So I think we have to distinguish here between meibutsu, which I usually translate as famous objects, but how, are, that word is sometimes translated as masterpiece, um, which are the treasures from the Ashikaga collection or their, their peers, right? So often antique Chinese works, some really special Korean or Japanese uh, utensils. Objects that have that pedigree and that have individual names are almost like singular objects, right? You can put an insurance value on the Mona Lisa, but in, in some sense, you can't really quantify the value of that kind of heritage object. And I think something similar can be imagined to be true for, for Meibutsu. But over time, that term was applied so um, almost lazily. So many things were called Meibutsu and uh, objects, new objects could be called meibutsu by a tea master who was willing to, to inscribe a, a tea box saying that it was a meibutsu. And lists were made of meibutsu. So they indeed became commodities. And we start to get pricing for tea utensils in the Tokugawa period that help us to get a sense of the economy of these objects. Um, in the late 16th century, this is not my expertise. It's not something I've looked into a lot. I think we occasionally see, see prices. Maybe more importantly, though, we see warlords like Hideyoshi rewarding their vassals with a single tea utensil for unimaginable acts of violence. Hideyoshi, one of his generals would go and sack a castle and take 800 heads, and he would reward him with a beautiful tea bowl. I, that, those kinds of equations start to make me feel uncomfortable but it gives you a sense of the value that was placed on these very special objects in this period of endemic warfare. Thank you. Um, there are actually three kind of similar questions about um, Rikyu's disciples and Christianity. Um, could you talk a little about that? Sure. And also, um, the, the, I guess, the place of the West in tea practice during um, the Sengoku period? Wonderful question. Yeah. So this exact period that I've been talking about today is the most international period in all of pre-modern Japanese history. Japan has uh, Europeans, uh, Portuguese merchants, Jesuit uh, priests, um, eventually uh, British merchants, uh, Dutch traders, uh, you know, in the streets of Kyoto, uh, traveling between cities. Um, Christianity, uh, enjoys decades of success uh, spreading across whole swaths of the archipelago in the 16th century. So this is uh, indeed uh, a lively international period, and there clearly was the influence of the West and of Christianity in the world of tea. Um, we sometimes see uh, artworks from this period, whether it's a tea bowl that has a cross design on the interior, or whether it's lacquer objects that could have been used in a tea gathering, but also might have been used in a, in a religious ritual, a mass, um, circulating uh, in Japan. Many um, uh, works of material, visual, and documentary evidence about Christianity from this period were destroyed during the Tokugawa period when Christianity was strictly outlawed. And even owning an object with a Christian symbol could have resulted in a death sentence. So to some extent, we really do not know how deeply Christianity um, might have been intertwined with certain strands of tea practice. Some have suggested that Furuta Oribe, the tea master who served Tokugawa Ieyasu, um, was sentenced to death in 1615 because of his support for other warriors who were Christian. I think there's more involved in the politics of that decision than just religion, but um, it's very difficult to excavate just how closely connected Christianity might have been to Chanoyu because of the later prohibitions. Um, to move again more toward objects specifically, um, there are two questions about uh, the 
about tea treasures made in Japan. So for example, prior to the Ashikaga collection, were there tea treasures that were produced in Japan as opposed to China? And um, in the Sengoku period, um, were there you know, Japanese master potters or other utensil makers whose works were um, being treasured in, in yeah. that contemporary mo moment? So on the, the basic answer really is no. Um, Japan has an incredibly ro robust tradition of ceramics. And there are many ceramic centers uh, across the archipelago in the medieval period. There used to be this theory that there were six main kilns, and that has been comprehensively um, uh, proven to be false by archaeologists in Japan. There were many streams of ceramic development with kilns all across uh, Japan. And they produced all kinds of wonderful wares. But the sort of idea of these luxury treasures that the wealthiest and most powerful um, warrior leaders would use in the Ashikaga period, those really were primarily um, Chinese objects. Um, there were some kilns that started to reproduce Chinese styles and tried to create their own versions of Chinese glazes that were sought after uh, and were considered um, something like prestige pieces. Um, but there were not named potters really until the Raku tradition uh, and Chojiro, the, the potter who seems to have collaborated with Sen Norikyu in the late 16th century. And the Raku family that Chojiro founded, the workshop that became a familial tradition, um, took that, that name, Raku, as a seal that they marked their tea bowls with, but also eventually as uh, a, a familial name. That was really one of the origin points of the idea of a kind of master named potter. There were sometimes names or inscriptions on ceramics before that made in Japan, but those seem to be related to shipping or place of manufacture, and they're not about the status and prestige of the object. Um, Japan has a long history in the pre-modern period of relying on imported material, visual, and textual culture from China and also Korea, but not being smothered by it, right? Picking and choosing, taking the parts that, that matter and that resonate, uh, and then innovating, right? Letting those cultural practices evolve. And that's certainly what happened in tea and the world of ceramics. You've alluded to this um, in your answer just now, I think, but given how prized and how commoditized um, famous objects, specifically famous Chinese objects, meibutsu were, um, was there a lot of forgery mm. in that period? The a great question. Um, so first of all, the concept of forgery um, is of course known in pre-modern Japan, but it, it has, I think to some extent, a different context. Um, the idea of a respectful reproduction or what in Japanese is known as an utsushi is absolutely central to traditions of making, but also traditions of collecting. So that if uh, there was a beautiful work of calligraphy by an aristocrat from the Han period, someone who had the pleasure of viewing that work of calligraphy and was him or herself a talented calligrapher, as a matter of course, would make a hand-brushed reproduction. That's one of the ways beautiful works of art were disseminated and, and honored. And sometimes over time, the distinction between the original and the utsushi was muddied. So it's not quite a tradition of forgery, but there is a problem of authenticity in Japanese art as there is in every tradition of art everywhere in the world, especially when viewed from the modern perspective where um, pedigree is so important. Um, I'm not aware of deliberate attempts to create forgeries of individual objects until the, the emergence of urban commodity culture in the big cities of the Tokugawa period. So the late 17th and the 18th centuries, you have books being published about how to make perfect Raku ceramics, except those books are not published by the Raku family. They're being made by other potters who want you to be able to make your own Raku ceramics at home and maybe get away with selling them as the real deal. Um, but in the period I'm talking about, the, the late 16th and then just the first few years of the 17th century, um, I don't know if Louise Court is on the call. She would know for sure, but I'm not aware of 
recognizable instances of what we would call forgery. Great, thank you. That's fascinating. I had no idea that there were books about how to make your own raku in the 18th century. That's amazing. Um, one other question about the ceramics. So in with several of the tea caddies that you showed, the um, kind of eggplant shaped and colored ceramics, they had off-white lids. Yeah. Do you know what the material of those lids um, is? So it's usually ivory imported from China. Um, and uh, of course, that becomes an issue in the movement of these objects around the world today, where there are in some places strict rules about ivory. Um, although uh, I don't, and I don't understand the legal, um, uh, you know, rules around this well enough, but I think usually if it's part of a historic object, uh, transportation is allowed across borders. Um, but yeah, those we believe are a Japanese addition that those were not part of the original um, container usage in the, the place of manufacture. But, you know, it's interesting to note that a lot of the ceramics that are so beloved and preserved in Japan by Japanese tea practitioners fell out of favor in their places of manufacture in China and in Korea. Um, dynastic change, you know, cultural evolution, uh, the rise and fall of different styles of ceramics meant that um, the, the tea caddies and tea bowls that were so beloved in Japan weren't heavily collected in China. So in some cases, we're, we're only in the last few decades excavating the kilns in China where those objects were made and starting to really understand the full picture of their manufacture. A question about a slightly later period. Um, so how did the relationship between tea and politics or tea and government shift after the Meiji Re uh, Restoration? Wonderful question. Um, so tea was one of the hardest hit industries when the Tokugawa regime fell and the this group of oligarchs helped to establish the new Meiji government with the, the Meiji emperor as a new kind of modern monarch. Because so many of the systems of patronage that held up the institutions of tea, notably the, the three tea schools descended from Sen no Dikyu, so Ura Senke, Omote Senke, and Musha no Koji Senke, but also the many other tea schools that were founded by other disciples of Dikyu, the Enshu school, the Oribe school, um, the Sekishu school, those, all of those schools depended on warrior patronage. And with the collapse of the system of hereditary privileges and stipends that, you know, happened over the course of the first few decades of the Meiji period, tea practitioners were, or not tea practitioners, tea masters were out of a job. Um, and it took a few decades, but eventually these very savvy, incredibly well-educated and culturally influential leaders found ways to reposition tea and there were a few approaches. So one was tea was reinvented as a, um, a, a traditional art form that could be taught in girls' schools where there was a very strong emphasis on training women to be traditional and to be almost like protectors of the heritage of Japan in their bodies in an embodied way while men wore suits and went off and did Western business. Um, so tea became part of the curriculum of girls' education in modern Japan. Second, some wealthy industrialists, the, the daimyo of modern Japan, right? The, the men who established businesses and they were bankers and they owned steel companies. They fell in love with their nostalgic version of the past and they collected Buddhist art, they collected tea treasures, and many of them fancied themselves in a very late 19th, early 20th century kind of way, um, you know, tea practitioner dandies of the modern world kind of. And so they built up collections of, of tea art and helped to grow the appreciation for this traditional art that had almost been abandoned. Uh, and then lastly, there was a movement to reinvent tea as part of the new sort of brash, almost macho nationalism of Japan after the 1580s. And uh, a, a school of tea emerged that was new. It was like a new religion that was explicitly linking tea practice with the worship of the emperor. 
and was trying to sort of hitch tea to the wagon of Japanese nationalism and imperialism. Um, and so all kinds of different strands played out in really interesting ways that we don't have time to get into now. But in my opinion, fortunately, tea not only survived, it evolved, it grew, and it became uh, in, in some ways even more influential, as we can see by the fact that we're having this global talk based in Southern California with listeners from all over the world. Okay, I just wanted to mention that um, Rebecca Corbett, who works at USC, has written extensively about uh, the place of tea in women's education. And she actually gave a talk on that topic in this lecture series, maybe three or four years ago. Um, Hi, Rebecca. Yeah, hi, Rebecca. Um, <laughs> She's on the call. Yeah. Um, we keep getting more and more questions. And I, this one takes us back in time, but I, I'm very curious to hear your answer. So uh, this the person who asks this says, I don't really fathom how <laughs> Chinese shipping containers or you know cheap Chinese ceramics became Japanese treasures. What, what was the process for turning these very humble things of Chinese or Korean origin into maybe to? Um... <laughs> so it, it is a wonderful question. And in some ways, as I'm sure the questioner who I know uh, knows, it is also the key question. Because in some ways, that is the art of Japanese tea culture. The, the thing that makes all of this special is not only that there are beautiful objects that are being used in the course of the tea gathering that you actually get to handle rather than just look at from behind you know, a, a wall of glass. Uh, it's not only the political influence that tea came to have or the involvement of lots of VIPs from the 16th and 17th centuries. It really, I, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently and trying to wrestle with what it means, but it's, it's a form of creativity that involves appropriation, to be honest, you know, and we and we live in a world where cultural appropriation is something that we th we think and talk about a lot in meaningful ways, because in the identity politics of 20, 21st century America, um, it's in the news, it's 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 in the air, um, but in a sense, in the most generous and creative way possible, tea culture is about taking objects out of their place of manufacture, out of their original context, and saying, this object would work very well in the tea room, to send a message in the tokonoma, to hold beautiful green frothy whipped tea and to drink tea out of, uh, to have an ivory lid on it, an elegant little cap, and to hold powdered green tea. None of the objects that I just named are probably intended to be used in that way when they're made. But the, the, there's a word in Japanese, tori awase, which means the selection and arrangement of utensils. It's a, a process that the host of a tea gathering goes through when planning the tea gathering. I think we have to recognize as a, a, a process kind of like orchestration in classical music, that it is a work of profound creativity. And I'm still, it's something I want to write about, and I'm still thinking through what it means and how to make sense of it. But um, that, that question really got to the heart of what I think is really magical about tea culture. And it should be an invitation to all of us to look at the objects in our midst and think about how they can be re re reused and repurposed. Something old can real be, really be beautiful again. Beautiful, thank you. Um, perfect way to draw things to a close, I think. But I'd like, well, thank you um, so much. if you don't mind, if we try to bring Robert on for just a moment, um, because I think he may have something to say about how we could think about reusing and um, recycling objects in our midst. Specifically, Robert, um, does the Huntington host tea classes or tea ceremonies? And will we or do we collect and display tea utensils and other tea related artworks? So we did have uh, OT open houses and tea parties 
uh, in the Seifuan, which is the Uda Senke Tea House. And this was pre-pandemic. And with the pandemic, I think that we are rethinking how we will do that, but we hope to restart those types of activities soon in the future. We are also having a Japanese house, a 320-year-old Japanese house uh, that we are rebuilding as part of the Japanese garden. And uh, that, unlike the Seifuan, which is a four and a half mat room, so basically nine by nine square feet, this is a 3,200 square foot uh, house. And we hope to have activities in there as well as having display items. We have two tokonomas. And uh, so this will, I hope, will, will really be the center of a Japanese cultural village. Great. So, um, thank you, Robert. And Professor Patelka, thank you so much for your illuminating talk and for your generous responses to the questions this evening. Um, thank you very really much was, for the opportunity. It was a delight for me um, both to hear the talk and to hear uh, just how expansively you answered these questions. So thank you so much. And um, the next lecture in the series will take place, I think, on Thursday, February 23rd. Um, it will be a talk by Professor uh, uh, Shre Le uh, from Oregon State University, who will be looking at the place of calligraphy in Chinese gardens. And then the, the lecture series will continue later in the spring. Um, I also just would like to mention that on Saturday, March 4th, Huntington is hosting a symposium on the Asian American experiences in California, past, present, and future. Um, it will bring together uh, both scholars and activists and writers from actually across California and parts of the other parts of the United States to look at um, the histories of Asian and Asian American communities in California and to also think about um, how those communities may change uh, in the, the years ahead. Um, that event will be held in person at the Huntington, but will also be live streamed on the internet. So I hope uh, very much that you all can join us for some of these future events. And thank you again for being here. And please join me in thanking Professor Patelka again for his uh, wonderful lecture this evening.